Good, good evening, Sudeep. Sudeep. Good evening, lovely to see you, Indran. Likewise, it's wonderful uh, to have this chance to, to talk with you about, about Anthropocene and, and, uh, and, to, and the art of poetry, which I know we've, you practice and we both practice and been doing it for some time now. So hopefully we have some uh, truths to share with our, our listeners and viewers. Um, you know, Sudeep Senan uh, uh, is a poet uh, a photographer, an editor, a translator. He's um, a, a host, a poetry host. I, I do uh, poetry, Poets and Writers Studio International with him once a month and among other activities and uh, a ceaseless proselytizer for poetry and, and bringer of different poems and poets together. Um, right now he's in Delhi and has been there for some time, some years. Um, and, you know, this book, Anthropocene, written literally from his house, from his library, and from the terrace outside, where I understand you, you walk and, and say hi to your neighbors and hi to the birds and to the sky and, and, and your photographs. So there are lots of, it's a fascinating sort of autobiography, in a sense, at the same time as it is a call, you know, of alarm or, or recognition of what's going on. Tell us a little bit about what was the, your thinking when you came up with this, uh, with this book, this title, which is, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a long title, right? You, uh, go ahead and tell us, tell us the title. Well, the, 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 the main title is Anthropocene, but right. there's a subtitle, which is Climate Change, uh, Contagion and Consolation. Uh, all the four C's, uh, right? In, right. Uh, my own fascination with symmetry and asymmetry and tonality and atonality. But clearly, the subtitle tells you about what the book is all about. Um, I didn't plan to write this book, uh, but you know, we had a bad, as we know in, in India, we've had a really bad uh, couple of years with the pandemic. Right. Um, Climate change is an issue which I've been following seriously for a long time. So it's not as though um, I thought of writing a book on it just because it's uh, an issue that is current. Uh, but because of the lockdown, because suddenly all uh, my travels, um, I travel six months of the year normally, you know, to, you know, certainly to Europe and sometimes even to the States for work. A um, lot of it is poetry related and teaching related, teaching creative writing and so on. All that stopped. And, um, you know, we were stuck in, uh, stuck in my house. And, um, but of course, at one level, when I'm here in Delhi, this is what I do. I am mostly stuck in my house. I'm kind of not that social. Uh, having said that, of course, you know, when I meet friends, okay, you know, in the evenings, you know, I can be gregarious, but generally, most of the time, I'm by myself, I like my solitude, and uh, it was, you know, when people talk about uh, quarantine and uh, solitary existence, all that, as you probably know, are very familiar uh, tropes and uh, situations for writers, poets, and so on. So in that sense, that wasn't very uh, a, a problem area because it was familiar, but was problematic was the interaction with other human beings and the fact that you can't travel. So what do you do? I mean, you know, you write. And then of course, it, it, it was such a tumultuous time that you cannot but not respond to what's happening. Right. And when you're constrained in terms of space, you find innovative ways to look at the world, you know? So for instance, uh, I have this window in front of me and, you know, there's this gorgeous big neem tree, which acts like a big curtain, uh, it's a picture window. And I've always seen it and I've occasionally written about it, but then when you're so uh, intensely locked down, then you actually see at a micro level things that you tend to gloss over. And because one couldn't leave the home, you know, terrace was the only place I, used, I could go to for my walks and, you know, to have some fresh air. Um, and uh, and then and everybody, this is early stages of the lockdown. The first before the first wave, uh, or during the first wave, very early stages of the lockdown. Now almost two years ago, 
you know, all the neighbors were also out, something that had st stopped. In my childhood, of course, you know, people were out much more than, you know, uh, now. Um, you know, you were out in the garden and the neighbors would walk by and, you know, people would just pop in for tea and, you know, they were, you would talk across the walls. It was very common. Right. So it was actually quite nice that that happened because, you know, you're talking across from the terraces and adjacent terraces and so on. So it sort of brought back a lot of memories. Also, um, I just tend to uh, photograph things and, you know, with mobile phone these days, you know, it's always in your pocket. And uh, suddenly, because of the lockdown, the pollution situation in Delhi improved vastly. So after a long time, you know, one could see blue skies, the birds were back, and, you know, it was just a sort of a joyous uh, moment. So as it turned out, I would take pictures every day, and I realized I, I'd been photographing the same spot. You know, there was a tree and the sunrise, sunsets, uh, for over a month, I'd I photographed and I had all these, you know, about 50 photographs from the same exact point. Right. And I selected that as an illustration of how skyscapes transform themselves. Of course, it's very, very allied to the poetry I've written. So it was another side of visual, not representation, certainly, but it certainly act as, acted as a contrapuntal uh, uh, image. Uh, yeah, that's a uh, fascinating side to this book. I mean, that you then suddenly you're turning the pages, and then you come to the sort of third or fourth section. There you have these 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 images, these photographs, and accompanied by the uh, with with words, with images. I mean, two two three line poems. You know that are yeah. uh, that accompany. Yeah. So the, those two three lines poems are basically extracts from the poems which are in the book. Right. In fact, some some reviewers have mistakenly thought that those are poems on themselves. Separate they can poems. seem yeah. like sort of, you know, of, of um, uh, non-haiku-like haikus, but they are, they're on, they are on. They are actually just lines from various poems, various poems. in the book, because I wanted to thread them together. Right. And the poems were not written for the photographs and neither the photographs were taken for the poems. And of course the book, as you rightly point out, it is multi-genre, so there's poetry, there's prose poetry, there's uh, sort of um, um, meditations written in prose, there's photography. The aspect of design is very, very important in, in, uh, in the book. Because, yeah, you know, the I, I, I agree. And, and talking about, let's talk about design for a minute because the architecture of this book fascinates me. And the, the, the fact that in a sense, you're an architect and a poet at the same time and, and, and a photographer. I mean, all of these things, so I, I, it's almost as if, you know, when there's a little line about the sound and the sense, or if you have the, if you have the rhythm or something, the words almost don't matter, they just fall into place. So I think you have the architecture, you, you create the architecture in your, I mean, with, with, I mean, every piece is a, is a beautiful sort of uh, design, you know, and uh, it's almost uh, not that the words are irrelevant, but that they, <laughs> when you have the house built uh, finely, you know, sketched and 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 well constructed, then um, you're almost almost creating a sort of template for 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 the reader to fill in as he or she wishes. So anyway, Indeed. no, it's it's, it's a it's uh, I think you put it very beautifully. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, I'm not an architect. I did study architecture. I was mm -hmm. planning to be an architect. And what did I end up doing? Study literature and, you know, became a poet, you know, always take decisions which are not very practical. Yeah. But yes, architecture is something that, you know, has interested me. I had four years of architectural and engineering drawing in school. So it's it's very much just more than just an interest. Um, for what? instance, the house I live in, I design myself. Ah, okay, entirely. okay. Yeah. And I know yeah. you make films as well. So, I mean, that's yes. another kind of... Well, Columbia, yeah, Columbia, I, you know, my the thesis, final thesis at the Columbia J School was uh, documentary films. And then I followed that on with a degree in uh, filmmaking from the new school just after Columbia. Okay. Uh, so it was a very important, that you know, and the first... I don't know, maybe uh, six, seven years of my working life, I was making documentary films. Uh, so right. that's right. something that I, you know, I've, I've, I've been closely associated with. And, and I would shoot the films myself. 
So the camera was ver a very important tool. Yeah. Uh, um, I always about, no, no, sorry. Talking about the camera as the eye, you know, there's a kind of um, mechanical aspect to the camera as well, isn't there? I mean, the, it it works a certain way all the time, but then but then there's a human aspect that shapes what the the mechanic is aspect is seeing and to, and that's where you come in with your with your poet's vision i think with each with each piece but i mean it's it's an art uh, that you do that is very postmodern very contemporary in that sense because you you assemble you reassemble you look at verses from other poets uh, the po contemporary poets uh, poets have passed on you cite them as epigraphs you weave their lines into your own poems. You have a dialogue with them. I mean, there are poems where you dialogue with, in dialogue with a poem by Fiona Sampson, for example, a poem by uh, you honor and this beautiful elegy, um, Driftwood about uh, Derek Walcott. Um, there are poems dedicated to poets and writers like Amitav Ghosh and, and so on, Kwame Daw. So tell us about, Tell, and, and why do we read, why did you read two or three of the poems so our listeners who may not know your work uh, will hear a few, then we'll come back and talk about them. Yeah, let me just answer the question before yeah. I read the poems. Sure. Because, sure. It, you know, the, the, the mood that you create with the poem um, is very different. And, and so when you answer these, okay. your question, um, it might sound very prosaic. Um, Yes, so, um, you know, it is just, I read voraciously, poetry especially. I mean, I try and keep up with poetry as much as I can, especially poets who I admire, young poets who send me their work, um, friends over time who are writing. I, I try and keep up with it as much as possible. In India, it's a bit difficult because, you know, you don't get, it's very difficult to get hold of the books. But many of my friends, you know, would just send me a copy, you know. So, you know, that's what we do. We swap books. Um, Unfortunately, when I'm traveling, I can give a, you know, give an actual copy of the book to my friend. But here, from so far, PDFs have to do, unless there's an edition in the states. Which, by the way, Anthropocene will also come out in the states in Jan, January, as a new okay. edition. Uh, so it'll be much more easily accessible. So while I'm reading all this, um, so poetry is one part, but also the visual landscape is very important. Because of photography, I sort of see things in aspect ratios of four by three or 16 by nine, or it's, it's, it's almost built into my kind of uh, human eye aperture. Mm. Um, uh, similarly, my ear is also very in much in tune with music is, a, is, a, is, is something that I've always enjoyed uh, very, very much. Often mu uh, music is constantly on not cacophonous music when I'm writing, but certainly music is on. Uh, so the calibration of both spaces and the tonal quality of uh, music uh, contributes to the architectural part of uh, the poetry. Dedications. Now, dedications are a curious thing. Um, when I've written a poem, it's not necessarily always dedicated to someone, unless, of course, it's very specific. If I'm writing an elegy, or if it's a birthday, I want to gift it to someone, then it's a different thing. But when I finally, you know, uh, put a book together and I'm just revising it, you know, sometimes I just feel like some parts of the poem reminds me of something or a book I've read. And I feel like just gifting a poem to a friend. So some, you know, so when you see the dedications on top of some of the poems, they're not necessarily linked with that person at all. It's just a piece of art I've created, which I've gifted to that person. It's like taking a photograph or doing a painting and you come and buy the painting in my gallery, except that here it's just a gift. So therefore the dedication. Um, it's also, as you rightly pointed out, it's honoring people, honoring people who you've liked, disliked or admired and so on. Because many of these people are you know, formidable people in their own right, whose work is uh, very thought provoking and uh, parts of their creative and intellectual enterprise seeps into your own space. So uh, when you, as we say, when we are our age, you know, you know, 
you know, it's nice to be generous because, you know, one's lived through a young age and so on. So that's how the dedications happen. Uh, uh, sometimes it's a gift, sometimes it's an actual act of honoring. But let me uh, read uh, uh, one of the poems you wanted me to read, which is called uh, Disembodied. It's the second poem in the book. It's fairly self-explanatory, um, but it's uh, very much located in the city I live in, which is New Delhi. And New Delhi, as you know, is uh, terrible when it comes to pollution, especially in the winter months. And I'm an asthmatic patient, so it becomes almost unbearable. Partly it comes from there, but you know, it's the whole idea about climate change is obviously embedded in this whole thing. Disembodied. My body carved from an abandoned, sorry. My body carved from abandoned bricks of a ruined temple, from minaret shards of an old mosque, from slate remnants of a medieval church apse, from soil tilled by my ancestors. My bones don't fit together correctly as they should. The searing ultraviolet light from Aurora Borealis patches and etch corrects my orientation. Magnetic pulses prove potent. My flesh sculpted from fruits of the tropics, blood from coconut water, skin colored by brown bark of Indian teak, my lungs fueled by Delhi's insidious toxic air, echo asthmatic sounds, new vinyl dub remix. Our universe where radiation germinates from human follies, where contamination persists from mistrust, where pleasures of sex are merely a sport, where everything is ambition, everything is desire, Everything is nothing, nothing and everything. Mm. White light everywhere, but no one can recognize its hue. No one knows that there is color in it, all possible colors. Body worshiped, not for its blessing, but its contour, artificial shape shaped by Nautilus. Skin moistened by L'Oreal and not by season's first rains. Skeleton strength not shaped by earthquakes or slow molded by fearless forest fires. Ice caps are rapidly melting, too fast to arrest glacial slide. In the near future, there will be no water left or too much water that is undrinkable, excess water that will drown us all. Disembodied floats afloat like Noah's Ark. No GPS, no pole star navigation, no fossil fuel to burn away, just maps with empty grids and names of places that might exist. Already, there's too much traffic on the road. Unpeopled hollow metal shells without brakes swerve about, directionless, looking for an elusive compass. Bravo, Sadiq. What a, what a fine point. I mean, a, a really a rich, um, you could spend uh, hours just taking uh, a look at each each phrase there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I look, uh, and and you know, you dedicate you it, the poem to Amitabh Ghosh, of course, who's who is a great writer uh, as well, and a, and a writer on this subject, you know. Of, Indeed, yeah. Uh, and so it was really the dedication, as I was telling you about dedication. Yeah. This dedication happened much later after I'd written the book and right. the great derangement made a big impact on me. And now of course, volume two of great derangement, the nutmeg curse is coming out next month. Uh, so it was just a kind of a saying, thank you for writing that book. And right. because right. this is so related to the kinds of issues he talks about in many of his novels, but that particular book, in, in that book in particular, 
Um, but yes, it's, it's, it's dense. The poems are very dense. They are, you know, the phrases are very, very uh, condensed. So when a poem like that has phrase, phraseology, which is so dense, then what one of the ways I try talking about architecture and placement on the page is I've placed the poem in a kind of scattered way. It looks like a very fragmented poem. Right. So when I read it, it's very lyrical and they form. I could just as well put it together in tersets if I want. But I purposely kind of spread it out over the page because part of it, the visual representation is the fragmentation of the world itself and how things are sliding and glaciers are moving and the tectonic plates are moving and so on. So that was part of it. And the white spaces, you know, just allow for these little islands of uh, phrases to kind of float on their own because on they themselves are like atolls right. who are about to be drowned if the sea level rises. Yeah. So there's a lot of thought. Yes. No, but I love that image of the, I mean, it's sad, it's horrifying to think <laughs> of the islands uh, being sub, uh, submerged, you know, countries disappearing because uh, as the sea levels rise. And yet uh, the poem is um, is being true and being uh, to the, the beauty of of what's going down the long slide in a sense, you know. And um, it's interesting what you say about that you could have written the poem in tersets, or you could have written the poem in a, in a more sort of traditional way, I suppose. But of course now the traditional is 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 non traditional in a sense after Eliot's, you know, free verse opening up the the line and and the 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 page to 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 the word experiment is sort of it's hard, funny to know what what is experiment anymore in poetry because, yes. Uh, yes at the same time I, I i salute your your opening your playing with space and with um, i just i just think it's an and, and i as a poet would feel inspired to to do more of that or to, to, to do it again or to go back to that. Yeah. See, the thing is about this kind of experimental poetry, um, or at least the layout, certainly, because this, as I said, could have been, uh, uh, I could make the lineations look more traditional. Right. The, the danger is if it doesn't work, it can be disastrous. So you have to be very, very careful about which ones. It's like implosion and explosion. I kind of took a traditional looking poem and exploded it and let it scatter. Right. Now, if I go through the uh, drafts, I think this poem was more regular. My first 10 drafts might have been much more regular, but I decided much later to have the layout like this. And then you'll see uh, other poems in this book, which are very, very strict metered poems. There are sinkings, there's, a, there's sonnet sequences, there are uh, Sistinas and so on, and you know, so there are lots of different kinds of that aspect as well. Um, Tell me, another thing that struck me reading the book was the poems that are descriptions of certain, for example, the heat or the cloying heat or the excessive heat of of, of uh, that you are experiencing, let's say, uh, in in Delhi at a particular time of the year, or, or but then there's the 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 stench of death and the heat of the the Sort of coming, uh, I, I'm in my imagination from the the funeral pyres, you know, of all the yeah. people being being uh, uh, turning to ashes. But but in terms of this, here, where does the poem? What's the per? What's the, un, the the final sort of purpose of the poem? Is it is it to create that image and then to let let the reader take it and and interpret it and and move, or 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 is it to infuse the image with some kind of teaching or some kind of uh, uh, a point that you want the reader to, to come away with and say, or an agenda. I, I know this may seem like a trick question, but it's just, I'm just curious to know when you're writing a, a description of, uh, maybe you could read one or two of those poems that, I, that I'm referring to where you're talking about the heat you know the micro poems, and it's what you're looking. Yes, yes, uh, yes. And, and just. But I'll answer you. I'll, I'll answer your question yeah, because I ahead. know where you're coming from. Yeah, it's right. not a trick question. I don't think you're trying to trick me here <laughs> on the program, <laughs> but it's 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 a provocative question, certainly. Now, um, it's a bit of both. I want to lay out 
a palette of images and let right. then let let the reader decide where to take it that's very important you know part part of keeping the poem open ended because you know you really you want the reader to engage and make something out of it beyond what you've done so because i think good readers are much more intelligent than the writers themselves <laughs> because they actually <laughs> uh yeah i mean very good readers you know they are the ones who lift lift the book to another space because of right. course we do our, our bit and then they do their bit um i never have an agenda when i'm writing a poem you know I'm, I'm, i poetry for me still happens in a very old fashioned way i'm suddenly inspired by a bolt of lightning and i scribble some phrases down and um at some later point when i'm revisiting the you know my notes i you know the poem will form or i would write out the first draft very quickly and right. then revisit it you know a few months later to see where it goes so i never have an agenda unless of course someone asks you to write a commission poem for the longest time when i was a young poet i used to really sneer at the idea of how can people write commission poems you know that's just, just you know just doesn't sit well but i know you know when you get more skilled it is possible to do you know i mean if someone now tells me okay write on this particular topic and within so many lines and within a particular uh, metrical framework i can do it because we just more seasoned it's like say to give you a example of uh, a cricket you know sri lanka and and india both great cricketing nations and you think of say uh, a former cricketer from india uh, a captain azuruddin who had just the most beautiful leg glance in the whole world now when you see him leg glancing say thompson or lily so effortlessly you feel gosh this is magical it's poetic it's like balletic <laughs> but why does he do it that way because this hours of practice in the nets and experience that's what makes it like so easy because it's not the easiest thing to do so the same thing with form once you actually master it and we, we we can't master anything in one lifetime but certainly become adept at it then uh, working around those things are much easier certainly i definitely feel again in a traditional way that it is good as a young poet to write formal verse because then you know when you're breaking the form then you know what you're doing right if right. your palette is only free verse and experimental verse it will be very difficult for you to do the other side not that it's important but it's important to kind of have the tools to play with which is why no two books of mine are ever the same critics of my poetry of especially academic serious academic critics have found it really problematic how do we pin this guy right, you know right, right. you know my, my book distracted geography is an archipelago of intent was entirely based in scotland so here's an indian who's writing right. about scotland right. as a native scottish person and that particular book also is very interesting uh, in terms of architecture because it's a long thin poem and it's one poem it's a long poem and it takes place over 206 pages why 206 pages because the architecture of the poem is inspired by the human spinal cord also at the same time i was very very uh, immersed in reading uh, neruda and uh, pazas elegies which were shaped similarly if you take a like this country they come from like it comes from chile and if you take a photography of chile in fact a black and white photography of chile it looks like a human spinal cord so the two things were married together why 206 pages because there are 206 bones in the human body there are 33 chapters because there are 33 vertebra so there was all kinds of right biological right, uh, geographical mappings that came in and it was just fun it's completely unimportant for that poem for a reader but if you like that poem and if you want to revisit it again there are all these other little caves and cavelets or tributary yeah yeah no that that's that's great i must i must get hold of that or you must get that to me because i'd like yeah to, yeah like that's that's it. available in 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 america very easily the wings press i think that the american edition so it's just that's in texas uh they did uh, the american edition going back to your but let's hear a few more points because we i want to be sure that uh, uh, some of the variety is heard for example ie that uh, ah, which okay. is a lovely poem and and 
I, I, it's going to be a song, I, I understand. So it I'm is a song, actually. Yeah, in fact, uh, you can uh, play it. It's on YouTube. Okay. Is it possible? Oh, you can to play already. It? It's already there on, on YouTube. Uh, is it possible to play it? Well, we I are... mean, if you, if, you have it, uh, if you have it at hand, you can uh, to hit the tape. I, I, why don't you read it and we'll... I'll just read the poem. We can, yeah. we can have yeah. the, the song later. Yeah, go ahead. So that is, is the title is I dot E dot. Um, and it's a very sparse poem. And then it's dedicated to my son, Arya. And when Arya first read it, and he says, Baba, I don't really understand what it is, but it's very beautiful, <laughs> even though I don't understand it. And that's part, sometimes just the point, you know, the, 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 the visceral quality of aesthetics, the beauty itself. And then your mind can travel into lots of spaces. And, and you can interpret this poem in so many different ways. The obvious one is, of course, climate change. And, um, but just enjoy it for what it is. That is. That is because you hear the sound of a lone rustling leaf. You hear the sea. That is because I consider the sea silent. You hear its silence in my studio. That is, and because of that, the silence will not empty the sea of its leaves. Hmm. Lovely. The sea, the silence will not empty the sea of its leaves. So you can rest and, and, and have a drink and be content. <laughs> having produced that line and, and having produced it for your son, um, yes. obviously, once. Well, son, again, the dedication uh, came much later. You know, yeah, no, that's later. all right. Uh, yeah it's uh, yeah. and and tell me uh, about Derek Walcott now Derek Walcott among the various poets you've met and uh, in your life and and you've read um I know is very special to you and and to me and and to many uh, so tell, tell read why don't you read the poem uh, if you don't mind yeah, let me read the poem first and and talk um, about the the section of the book it, in which it's coming from because you organize the book in, in you know, under different subheads. And, yeah. and I think that's interesting for the listeners to know why yeah. that poem is so there. This is, this is in section six called Holocene uh, or geographies. Now, some poems like this does, you know, it can fit into various sections where, right. you know, because there are sections like um, obviously pandemic, global warming, climate change, um, contagion. And one can fit, you know, as you know, a poem in any of them. But what happens is if you put it in that section, then the reader will predominantly read it through that lens. But I wanted some of the poems to be much more open-ended. So I put it under geographies. And geographies can be anything, whether it's right. cerebral or actually earthly. Um, so that's the section it's in, and um, it's called Driftwood. And it was inspired by, um, I was in his house, I was staying in his house. Um, and uh, the room I was staying in had a little balcony and um, there was the banister railing, which was kind of weather beaten and some of it was broken and falling off. And, you know, I would sit there in early morning, have my tea, read and write. Few days later, I saw part of the banister missing. It was swallowed by the sea at some point, I'm sure. Or do, or maybe I just imagine it because it's just an interesting story. That's that was what prompted me to write the poem. And then, of course, you know, I dedicated the poem for Derek's uh, 85th birthday. So there was a gift later on. In what year did you write the poem? Do you remember? I was 85, it? when he was 85, so it must okay. have been a while ago. Uh, yeah. So Driftwood uh, for Derek Walcott and Sigrid Nama. And it opens with uh, Walcott's um, line from Archipelagos from the book Map of the New World. And I quote, at the end of the sentence, rain will begin. 
I mean, look at the audacity of this. The poet just writes, when the sentence ends, the gods will open up and it will rain. So as a young poet, I said, man, I mean, this is the kind of power and confidence you have. But then, of course, when you grow older, you realize, you know, there's so much more to it. And I quote that as the last line. It's in italics, of course. So when you see the poem, it's clearly uh, attributed to Walcott. Driftwood. At the end of the sentence, the rain will begin. Part of the banister railing is absent in spite of its strong metal rivet moorings. Termite eaten, consumed by the sea, I can see its woody skeleton float far away among the surf, its salt scarred coat tossing and struggling to keep afloat against the wave's incessant lashing. There is music in its disappearance, a buoyant symphony, note strokes resurrecting life, a new story, history restored by resilient fingers of a master artist. Wheelchair and weak legs of inconsequential impediments, his mind sparking with electric edge, whiplash wit at its most acerbic. There is generosity for family, friends, those who are gone and remain. And 30 new poems, an intricate magic of ekphrastic love. In the garden, in the front garden facing the same sea with Pigeon Island on the horizon's left, lies a cluster of wind eroded over rocks. Their shapes mimic a lost egret's nest, or a ballerina's curved arch, a stone memorial for a close friend. The driftwood is now out of sight, part of his house donated to the sea. In gratitude, the sea sings a raucous song, folded cumulonimbus clouds echo in synchronicity, a soundscape absorbing his commandment. At the end of the sentence, rain will begin. Oh, magnificent. You know, the part of the, the house is donated to the sea. I mean, I'm, I'm brought as, as a poet and a world, as a traveler as well to, to other seascapes, poets, and their homes by the sea. I mean, I'm thinking of Isla Negra, Pablo Neruda's, one of his homes, uh, yes. uh, which was fundamental to his work and, and, and to many of the things he saw from his window and walking by the sea. I'm thinking of your, on your terrace, um, uh, Derek painting, um, um, looking out at the sea. The sea is so important to his work and to Neruda's. And, and, but you're in Delhi, in, in a city, in, in, you're not near the sea, but yet, of course, feel free to, uh, to be a poet of the sea as well. I mean, you are a universal poet. I mean, there's no, you don't, I'm living in the moment in Rockville, quite uh, at some distance from the sea, but the sea is, is fairly present anyway in all of our lives on the planet. I mean, the ocean, it should really be called ocean, the planet really, given the amount of water and compared to land. But sea, but sea for me was never, never part of my literary landscape. It never is. Right, it right, never right. was. And so even I, now, even now when I'm in a seaside, I love it for a while, but because I'm not native to a seaside, you know, I get bored very easily because to me, the sea doesn't change that much or, you know, I'm not a kind of person who sunbathes. So it's hot. I'm usually under the umbrella with clothes on, right. maybe having a, having a cold drink and reading, you know, the other friends swimming and getting blanched and bronzed, not exactly my idea of happiness. So I'm much more of a mountain person. I love the mountains. I've written a lot on mountainscapes. But, you know, when you spend time 
in a, a, a situation like this, when you're in someone's house and so much of it is sea inspired and sea driven and sea soaked and the smell of that kind of sea, you know, the saltiness and so on is ever present. And the kind of, I could see the way the house is constantly eroding, you know, painting the house was a big expenditure, I'm told, in many of these countries because they just have to protect it from the weather. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when you're a poet, you just drop them in any landscape and that's fertile, you know, it doesn't matter really. The sea to me then becomes a churning cosmos, you know, it's like the mother's womb in, uh, in a micro way and the churning cosmos in a kind of a macro right. way. So it's this, this fluid space where you can inhabit. And, and, and then when you look at it closely, then you start seeing layers much more so than uh, I would have otherwise if I had spent time right. near the sea. Does Sigrid yeah. continue to live in the house? There she does, place? yeah, she does, yeah. It's, it's a stunning house, you know, it's a view of the Pigeon Island across the bay and there's an infinity pool in front, so, you know. And, the, and, you know, there are lots of uh, references to various things because it was a gift for him for his birthday. So uh, when I talk about the egret, uh, mm -hmm. one of his book is called The Last Egret, uh, then the stone memorial for a close friend. So when uh, Seamus Heaney was a very close friend of Derek Walcott. So when he died, I mean, he was very, very struck and, you know, very sad for a long time. And he told me that those stones under that palm tree those bunch of stones, that's my memorial for Seamus. Oh, so my. that's the reference to that. It's not important, but these little things which are so meaningful to him, I thought it'll be nice to kind of incorporate. Oh, now it's shared with, with whoever watches this, this conversation, listens to this conversation. That's wonderful. Thank you yeah. for sharing that. I, I, uh, Seamus Heaney is a great poet uh, and, 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 and their friendship along with the Joseph Brodsky, I said. Brodsky, a, yeah, it's quite and... that, 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 I mean, can you imagine? I mean, we don't have poets of that caliber at all anymore. <laughs> Probably I'm making a sweeping statement, but, you know, just the three of them gathering, right. all right. Nobel laureates eventually. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's right, that's right. All and uh, Brodsky, of course, was again, you know, an early influence in my life. I mean, New York City, you know, I met him right. there three times. Uh, and I was living in the village, as you know, and he was just around the corner in Morton Street. So I visited Brodsky in his, in his studio flat and, you know, he read some of my early poems and, you know, so that's another chapter and story altogether. Um, oh, yeah, and I didn't, I didn't know about you, uh, those meetings. No, I, so I, I never talked about it because, you know, when you were a younger poet and when you're in your sort of mid-30s and 40s, I never used to mention these things because, you know, people then can take it in the wrong way that, you know, you're dropping names. But now, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not saying one is that old, but now the names are being dropped uh, because of the virus and so on. Yes. So we have to. We have to <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you know, these are these are pop, very important part of my poetry landscape. So, you know, they a uh, 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 a student yeah. reader picks it up in any case, you know, right. because I've seen critics picking these references up and they piece it together, which is lovely. So now, right. you know, it's, it's an app, it's, 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 a, it's a story which is nice to tell because, you know, because these people are no more, you see? Yeah. If they were living, I would never, never talk about these people ever, you know, that was something that I just learned, you know, it's not something that you do. In but, this, uh, uh, in the few minutes we have left, I think it, I think we should talk about Anthropocene, human, human made, and what um, uh, I know. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Auden's line that poetry makes nothing happen, and that, and that you know, many poets rail against that line, and and many uh, accept it and go on with their their day to day. Uh, where do you see Anthropocene in the in the climate debates and the political debates and the literary debates uh, mm. and where do you see where are you going next in your uh, the, what are the projects you're working on now that you can share with us yeah. so Anthropocene was an accidental book but having been an accidental book it happened to be a very timely book 
So, you know, it, the publishing situation um, is really, really grim because most of the publishers have cut down their list by 70%, certainly right. in the last two years. So one feels very grateful that the book actually came out in this time. Um, a lot of it is to do with the timeliness of the topic, I'm sure. Uh, but, you know, it was also something that I was very passionate about. Uh, but the most important part of the book, there are various important parts of the book because it's structured, you know, in a particular way. But the last section is about hope, about light. And that is really the message of the book that, you know, come what may, we will still live on. You know, it's the only the human beings who have, who suffer from this kind of angst. The bird outside the tree comes and pecks every day. The leaves come out when they have to come out. The sun rises every day happily unhappily they don't they don't have these angst about anything the world actually will carry on regardless of our angst and that's very important to uh, important to uh, remember and in fact i bookend the last quotation in the book is from uh, this uh, great polish poet cheshire of uh, milos and i read this three lines because that's really what how i want to end the book the tonality of the book and he says, and I quote, my generation was lost, cities too, and nations. But all that a little later. Meanwhile, in the window, a swallow. <laughs> Lovely. Milos. It's beautiful. Yeah. beautiful. yeah. So yes, so what, uh, so the book, this book has taken very interesting turns because normally, um, you know, a book like this is discussed in the literary circles, it's in the books pages of the, you know, newspapers, and, you know, it's a more literary, literature-oriented kind of audiences would ordinarily read my work. I'm not saying others don't, but, you know, that would be a safe space, I would assume. Right. But even before um, the book was launched and when the PDF, uh, review PDFs were being sent out, I got contacted by the Norwegian Climate Agency and their writers' union they wanted to do an interview because we, they said nobody, certainly poetry, nobody has done a sustained book on climate change and the global warming. And can we talk to you? So that to me was very thrilling that, you know, scientists got in right. touch with me and that too in a non-native, uh, non-English speaking country. And they were interested in this. Uh, I was told uh, by the editor of the Week magazine, which you're familiar with, which comes out from the south of India, that... Uh, we are planning to send the book to the science reporter or editor, not a literature person for it to be reviewed. To me, that is thrilling because it's actually going beyond the, right, the, right. That's, the, that's, the literary that's... boundaries. And to me, that's important because, you know, poetry should also carry forward in a serious way beyond the poetry circles. Because I, I fully agree with you. With the, and I... Because it can be a ghetto. And, uh, you know, a lot of my... Uh, collaborations and poetry, as you know, you know, I, I, I collaborate with musicians and artists and because I'm a photographer and so on. So all, you know, there's, there's that interface. My next book, you were asking me, what am I doing next, is a book called The Whispering Anklet. It's all about classical Indian dance and Western dance. And classical dance has been a big obsession of mine for the last 35 years. And I've been writing on it. Some of the poems have appeared in the various books I've published thus far. But this book is gonna be all my dance poems. And uh, I was just, and uh, there's a friend of mine called Aditi Mangaldas and she's this absolutely stunning uh, Kathak dancer, one of the best in the world, I think, especially because when she uh, pushes the traditional Kathak into modern dance and she, you know, it's very, very contemporary. Um, so initially I thought, you know, I'll have photographs of dancers and the Bharatnatyam will have some Bharatnatyam dancers, Mahini Atam, Kathak, and then it became problematic because I didn't want the book to be cataloged because it's a book of poetry, actually. You know, the photographs are tertiary. So then I decided that, you know, I want photographs, but very abstract photographs, like, you know, just the corner of the eyelid or the nail or the toe ring or the swish of the garment. So very beautiful and abstract. So I asked Aditi, can I, you know, can you, do you mind modeling? So Aditi said, you know, I mean, of course, I'll be delighted to, but, you know, all my senior dancers will 
go crazy because this is, who is this? You know, why, why is she, be, you know, behind that? And I said, listen, don't worry. It you know, is my decision. It's ultimately my book of poetry. And we have a very dear common friend, uh, Dinesh Khanna, who's one of India's top photographers. So Dinesh shot Aditi for the book and the photographs are gorgeous. Gorgeous. It's very, very ethereal. Oh, you must let me see those photos. Yeah, yeah. When the when the book comes out, I think it's going to be the most exquisitely beautiful book. Unfortunately, a normal publisher, I don't know whether they'll be able to publish it. It's going to be very expensive. It's a four-color coffee right. table type, you know, right. ideally, right. Right. you know, because it's just very lush and all that. So that's what I'm working on. I mean, the poems are written, the photographs have been taken. Now it's uh, has to go out to the designing stage. And uh, when it, well, we're uh, excited. Together. I can speak for the collective we <laughs> outside of the poetry. No, and the good thing well. is, you know, the, the good thing is, you know, I intensely spend so much time with the photographer and a dancer. No poetry at all, because I was seeing the poetry in his photo photography and the poetry in her dance, and they see the same in mine. You know, wonderful, wonderful. so uh, and the wonderful thing is, of course, it's all when we chat about it we'd say that you know when you have a dance performance you know he, we can do some poetry readings and the books can sell there when i have literary events you come and come on stage and talk about this when he has photography exhibition then we can be part of it ideally speaking of course the pandemic came and everything you know this book was supposed to come out before anthropocene i see but it just got shelved because you right, know right right the right designer who's going to work on it you know just wasn't available so at some point, you know, hopefully next year, this book will come out. Wonderful. So that's what I'm working on. And then, of course, there are so many other projects, you know. I'm editing right. two big anthologies. One is the best Asian poetry um, of, of 2021. 20, the best Asian poetry very much is inspired by the best American poetry series. So Kitab publishes in, in Singapore ha already has a very fine list of best Asian short stories and best Asian science fictions. So this year they commissioned me to do the poetry volume, just launching the poetry volume, uh, the poetry section this year, poetry book this year. So of course, you know, it was an exciting project to get Asian poets in first time again right, right. in one volume, because initially, of course, you think about English language writers because, you know, we write in English and so on, but then I realized, my God, you know, there's Japanese and Korean, there's Farsi, there's Ukrainian, there's, you know, Filipino oh, writers. I'm exciting, I'm looking forward to it. It's uh, really, really exciting. Good, yeah, yeah, really, really exciting. So that's one book. And the other book, uh, is, it's 15th August, it was just 75 years of India's independence. So I've been commissioned to do a big anthology of modern Indian poetry in English, you know, spanning the 75 years. So it's manic at the moment. <laughs> That's what I'm doing, apart from so many other things one does. Oh my God. But it's nice to just be with poetry and it's nice to just, you know, you know, these are lovely moments when we just steal ourselves from daily life and just focus on poetry and is a is a beautiful bubble, I think. You know, we've gone over our time, but that's fine. But why don't we f finish with a, a, a poem? A poem. Yeah. It will, uh, yeah. And, and yeah. the outlaws will be the last words of this particular emission. Thank you so much, Radeep, uh, Zen, no for sharing this time with us. We're old friends, and it's good to be uh, good to be back uh, talking about your new book. Go ahead. Indeed. So let me end with a poem which you wanted me to read. Um, and this was written in the during the height of the pandemic, you know, during the lockdown. And uh, it's obviously a take on. It's called Love in the Time of Corona. Uh, and the way this happened too was very strange. You know, the Indian Express newspaper editor asked me to write a op-ed piece. But little did he expect that I'm going to send him a poem because that newspaper doesn't publish poetry. Right. But I sent him the poem and very gallantly and very brave of him, he actually printed the poem. And when he printed the poem, it became viral because in you know, a newspaper, Sunday newspaper, very rarely do you get it. So a lot of people read it and it got translated into at least 20, 25 languages all over the world because it was timely and so on. But anyway, that's, that's the backstory of this. It has uh, two epigraphs. The first one from Gabriel Garcia Marquez, of course, from, the La from Love in the Time of Cholera. And he says, I quote, I don't believe in God but I'm afraid of him. And the second quote is from uh, Bertolt Brecht. 
And it's again a famous one. In the dark times, there will also be singing. Sorry, in the dark times, will there also be singing? Yes, there will also be singing about the dark times. Faint indigo tints in the grays of your hair evoke memory. Krishna's love for Radha, its perennial longevity, its sustained mythology, its blue bathed lore. Such a life's enduring parallels. 14 years yet my heart flutters infatuated like first love. My hands fidgety, palms sweaty, pulse too fast to pick. I'm not allowed to touch your face. Cyber flurry emoji love cannot assuage fears or corona's comatose cries. I don't believe in God. In thousands, migrant workers march home. Hungry footsteps on empty highways accentuate irony. Social distancing, a privilege only powerful can afford. Cretans spray bleach on unprotected fur, clap, bang plates, ring bells, blow conches, light fires to rid the voodoo. Karuna's karma infected. Mood swings and sanitized quarantine, self-isolation imposed, uncontained virus, viral. When shall we sing our dreams epiphanies? City weather fluctuates promiscuously, mapping temperatures by polar graph. Tropics air conditioner chill, winter's unseasonal hailstorm, sky's pink blue spring. John Law Barger or John Law. Blue gray will mold into salt and pepper. Ash gray to silver white, then to aged white. My lungs heave, slow grating metallic crackles struggle to escape the filigreed windpipes. I persist in my prayers. I'm afraid of him. Hope, heed, heal our song in present tense. Thank you. It's a good one to end because that's the whole, the book is about that, hope. Yes. Heal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sudeep. And thank you for thank your time. Thank you, Indran. It's a real delight to do mm -hmm. this. It's a different kind of engagement. So I really enjoyed it. I know we could have gone on, but yeah. I'm glad yeah. we spoke. Thank you. From have a good, have a good, have a good evening, and uh, and uh, let's let's we'll be talking again. I know very soon. All yes. the best to you, my friend. Adios. Adios. Bravo. <laughs>